Good evening. My name is Andrea Hobley, and as president of the Woodbury Cottage Grove Area League of Women Voters, I'd like to welcome you to this important webinar. Tonight, we'll be hearing our, about our 2023 updates to voting and election laws. Our election season has begun, and one of our commitments is to ensure that we help voters feel prepared in order to complete their ballot. Uh, before I turn it over to Betsy Stites, who will be introducing our speaker for, for this evening, I want to reiterate the importance of the League's mission, vis values, and vision. The League of Women Voters is, a non, is nonpartisan, neither supporting nor opposing candidates or political parties at any level of government, but always working on vital issues of concern to members and the public. Our mission is empowering voters, defending democracy. Our vision is we envision a democracy where every person has the desire, the right, the knowledge, and the confidence to participate. And our value is we believe in the power of women to create a more perfect democracy. Now, I'll, uh, thank you for your time tonight to come and listen to us in this important session. And I'm going to turn it over to Betsy Stites. Hi, I'm just really thrilled to be here tonight. Uh, this is such an important topic, as Andrea has indicated. And we obviously have our authority here. Um, Michelle has <laughs> Michelle Woody, our executive director of the league here in Minnesota, has um, been working so hard with um, many individuals at the state to um, really help us move forward with our uh, voting laws. Uh, and so we're going to hear from Michelle tonight. But I really wanted to give us some background because everybody knows Michelle is our executive director and is passionate about the league. Um, but I think it's always good to hear about some of the wonderful background um, that she brings to her role. She has been um, serving our uh, local league, 35 local leagues across the state for the last six and a half years as our executive director. She, um, I'm proud to say, is a resident of Woodbury and has been involved in our community for the past 25 years. And she's done many, many things. She served as an elected school board member for South Washington County Schools. She's run four levy and bond referendums for our school district that included one with winning a winning margin of only five votes, which really reinforces how important it is for um, every person to vote. Uh, when not working on our democracy, Michelle enjoys our local open door community theater, time with her husband, two adult daughters, and dog Kiwi, and riding the trails of <laughs> Woodbury on her electric bike. Uh, we just got, uh, Jim and I just got one this past year too, and they're, they're just great. <clears throat> I'm going to turn it over to uh, Michelle, who's going to update us. We have our chat uh, open so that you can put questions in there because Michelle will be happy to answer questions, entertain questions after she gives us an overview. So Michelle, take it away. Thanks, Betsy. Great to see everybody. Love all my Woodbury League folks. Um, there is a lot to, to talk about, but I would definitely welcome questions tonight. I'm certainly talking to people who know a lot of this, uh, and sometimes it goes kind of fast, but um, so feel free to ask questions and Betsy, just interrupt me along the way. I'll kind of stop along the way too to see if we have questions. But we're gonna talk about the election law changes, but I also, what I think is fun on these um, on these Zooms is to get a little bit of the background flavor too of the things that happen to get where we are, because it is what, um, what we can all do and continue to do together as we keep our democracy together is learning about all the great partners and relationships and things that are happening in the background and helping people to appreciate uh, the value of the work we do as league members being connected to community members. So uh, it's fun to hear some of those stories. So we'll sort of throw those out too. We're also going to talk a little bit about Vote 411 and all of the great, amazing new election information we have for voters. I'm very, very excited and proud to, to show off our new web um, page tonight before we go, as well as talk about our other favorite topics, nonpartisanship, and a little bit of myths and disinformation thrown in. So uh, 
All right, I'm going to share my screen here, get it open. Here we go, hit the slideshow. All right, here we go. Well, <clears throat> so as you know, um, a lot of you will probably know that um, we passed over 30, well, it's up to 32 new laws that affect voting and um, elections. Some of them more powerful than others, but in total, they really, again, strengthen uh, the freedom to vote, protect our voters, they protect our institutions, and help empower our voters as well. And I put this little picture in. This was our uh, the big bill signing from House File 3. So House File 3 was sort of the big bill that had a lot of the legislation in it uh, this year. We had a separate standing bill for Restore the Vote and um, uh, other, other issues that came up, but this was the big bill. So this was a fun day for us to be able to uh, share our successes. And if you see the picture in the upper left with Joan Grow, uh, Joan Grow and I there, uh, Joan Grow was honored because it was the 50th anniversary of same day voter registration as well. So bringing in automatic voter registration 50 years after same day voter registration, um, really a lot of those great new voter laws started with Joan Grow. So it was really fun to have her there. So um, we're going to look a little bit at these uh, election policies and their effect on who can vote, how we vote, when we vote, and where we vote, all of which has already started, as you likely know, um, early voting started on Friday. So people are voting now and um, experiencing some of these changes. And the first was really our signature priority. And this was the restoration of voting rights for people who have completed a felony sentence are living in their communities. And uh, it was, I just love this picture. I mean, if you look around, so many of the people surrounding um, the governor too are people who have been affected um, by these laws. There was such excitement. It, it was just a thrill. This is a policy we've been working on um, for about 20 years for the League of Women Voters. So it was a, a big priority for us and the coalition is very exciting to get this past the finish line. So we've been working a lot now on, of course, helping um, our um, folks living in the community after their felony sentence learn about the law and also to have that confidence to participate. Uh, when you heard that in our vision, that's a big one, right? You can have all the information and know what it is, but how do you have the confidence to participate in the process. So we're gonna, we're gonna hit on that tonight. The other big one is automatic voter registration. Again, we've been working on this for a couple of decades. And um, this will not, is not in place yet. Um, now our um, Restore the Vote did go into effect early June 1st, so that um, our newly enfranchised voters could cast a vote in the primary election in August. Uh, but automatic voter registration won't be in effect until uh, 20, the 24 election. So they are very feverishly uh, <laughs> working on this issue right now. So to get that ready to go, but that will be really exciting. Now, also the Secretary of State said that there's actually, probably this will mean about 450,000 people will be uh, automatically registered to vote once this is all in full, full swing. So, you know, what you're dealing with here in Minnesota is we're going to be a very highly registered state. So we're going to talk about that, too, and what that means for us. Excited about youth. We love our youth voters, of course, and now there is the new pre-registration of 16 and 17-year-olds. So anyone who's 16 and 17 and meets the other requirements can submit um, a pre-registration just using the regular voter registration form and pre-register, which means they get in the loop, right? It's just a way to make sure that they're um, starting to activate their civic engagement early. And it's great to do that now that we also have the new civics um, education requirement that was also passed this year. So those things work really nicely together. Um, so again, here, June 1st, 2023, we have um, those two new laws don't affect January 1st, 2024, automatic voter registration. 
Now, it, it freaks me out when you think January 1st, because the bottom line there is we start voting for the president in January, um, technically, because we will have our presidential primary again um, in March. This will be our second presidential primary versus selecting um, the president, the partisan uh, selections of president. Those are partisan races, of course. <clears throat> and you have to pick a party. So we will be educating people too, again, about how to, to vote for president in the primary. But that means we have early voting. <clears throat> and that, so that means in January, at the end of January, the presidential election already will be in full swing. So get your sleep, people. We're going to be busy. <laughs> um, other effects. Uh, all the effects on how we vote, again, some really cool things. The permanent absentee voter list. This is great that you can apply to automatically receive um, an absentee or a vote from home. We still call it absentee voting in Minnesota, but we also, a vote from home is what it, it looks like and is uh, before each election. This was very confusing for folks previously. A lot of times you're like, well, did I already, did I? Did I already apply for a ballot? Is it coming to me? Um, people would be confused about this. So now you can sign up and say, hey, just always send me my ballot. I wanna do it that way. Um, the direct balloting, we now, instead of um, 14 days, it's now 18 days before an election. So there's more time to submit absentee ballots directly. A lot of people like to get that ballot at home, but then they wanna watch it go through the scanner. Um, and so there's more days to get all of that done, which is great. Absentee ballot delivery. This is, uh, some of these are really, um, really stand to, to make some big difference. And these are, are barriers we've seen. Um, and this is uh, providing same support to assisted living facilities and battered women's shelters that is available to healthcare facilities and veterans homes. So. We have a lot of assisted living facilities and independent senior living facilities in Minnesota. And they will, those facilities now will get more support for being able to, to capture and bring those absentee ballots to the polls. That is huge. I mean, this is thousands and thousands of seniors who, well, I'm not sure, I don't know, or who might, you know, a lot of, especially people maybe living in smaller facilities or just not the staff to help them, they're going to get extra help. Um, the time, return of absentee ballots, we have more time um, for the county election offices on election day to get those in. Uh, assistance to voters, I really like this one, requirement to limit physical assistance and marking ballots to no more than three individuals is removed. Now you would say, why do you need more than three, you know, three individuals? But people who vote in families, people who have uh, English as their second language, uh, not their primary language, it's a people like to come and support each other, and this really allows that. And a lot of these rules also just really kind of add extra clarity and support for our election judges, because as you know, a lot of you probably been election judge or you no election judges, and these are great laws that also just help clarify things to make for a, you know, a more stress-free voting environment. Of course, this is huge, how we vote, foreign language sample ballots and multilingual election judges. This is really, really um, a huge improvement to, to be able to have more um, interpreter assistance, more materials in other languages, which is a tradition started in Minnesota in the late 1800s when our ballots were done in, I think it was Norwegian, what did he say, uh, Swedish and Finnish maybe um, for our first round of immigrants. So this is great news. Um, okay, electronic signature on election day. Voters may sign either electronically on a poll pad or they can still use that paper certificate if they want it. Um, electronic voting systems by counties. And this is a really important one when it comes to some of the challenges we've seen with the people who are sort of more election deniers and wanting to make changes, but sort of retro changes that are not positive um, at the counties, which we've um, helped combat. And one of them is people want to return, as they say, to hand counting of all ballots. 
Um, of course, we now in a, you know, a state of 5 million people, you know, three and a half million voter registered voters, which was about to soon be um, close to 5 million hand counting individual ballots. Number one, it doesn't, um, it, it, it's not reasonable, but it certainly doesn't enhance accuracy. Um, you know, an, an interesting story here is that actually we, when we got the scanners, the ballots, um, the Dominion machines and all the things that are scanning our ballots, right? That actually came from Republican Secretary of State Mary Kiffmeyer. It was Mary Kiffmeyer who really wanted to increase the accuracy of the ballot count through having the scanning system because the scanner tells you at the time you're casting your vote, if there was a problem, like it didn't read something right, it would say, oh, we're rejecting your ballot. You can redo it. So the, the, the scanner helps that accuracy. That's why um, we had it in place. And that's why we want to keep it. Um, now, uh, Betsy mentioned that I was part of um, a, a referendum. I led a levy and bond referendum, which brought us the new Altman High School, or, or middle school, sorry, and several other uh, improvements around the state. I mean, it was the last bond we approved which means if we hadn't approved that, we would have such serious overcrowding in our schools. So I always, I mean, there's not a time I don't drive by um, the new Altman and just like kind of get teary because I'm like, what if we hadn't gone to, you know, the phone bank one night and lost five votes? And what was interesting on that one was that we had 18 votes. We were up by 18 votes in the final vote, but there was a vote no. So they did, it, it was a, close enough to have an automatic recount. So it was really interesting to be part of a recount. Again, we have these safeguards in place. If the election is close, things are recounted. So it was so interesting to watch the recount because it's totally both parties are there and you're literally looking at every single ballot. But when mistakes are made, what the mis it's not really a mistake, right? What it, a lot of times what it is is trying to decide what somebody's intent was. You know, somebody sort of does half a circle or they do a circle and cross it out. And so you're trying to interpret, um, well, what did they mean by that? There wasn't one ballot we encountered that we felt there was some sort of fraudulent activity. It's just that determination of intent, which can be confusing. Well, we were up by 18. After that, so we were challenged. And then uh, the vote no, we went to court and ended up with five. So it was really great for, um, to have went, gone through that process and just a reminder of all those safeguards we have in place um, for people who are worried about the integrity of our system. So anyway, oh, the other part I wanted to say on that then, so what this new law says, once a county has adopted an electronic voting system, it cannot return to hand counting or mechanical tallying of ballots. So that means it, it is that point. Once you do that public accuracy test, we have selected our voting machine. If a group of citizens want to come forward and say, no, we don't want you to use that anymore. We want you to hand count it. Um, this kind of helps those county commissioners deal with that pressure they were feeling in about eight different counties to say, no, nope, we can't do that. The law says we can't do that. We need to use the machine system. And that is the right thing to do. Um, so again, lots of things are happening in, in June, uh, are already taking place right now. And in June 24, we'll have that permanent absentee voter ballot um, request available. So other things in terms of um, it, when we vote, lots of different little changes that again, increase access to, um, you know, to the voting process for everybody. More official, time off from work to make sure that people can vote if they want to vote on election day. Oh, I lost my little thing here, moving my little cursor around. Okay. All right. Let's see. Here we go. Um, so again, when we vote June 1st already, the voting hours before an election, we have more voting hours available. We now have time off uh, from work that has been expanded and in January, we'll also have more early voting uh, available to us. Okay, where we vote. 
temporary polling places, this um, is the biggest one here is the second bullet. County auditor must establish an additional polling place for at least one day on Indian reservations if requested. This is a big um, step forward. We find in, a, in our, um, you know, 11 different indigenous nations, we find that, I mean, that's, we still have a lot of people who are not registered to vote who, and we really need, or are registered and don't use that uh, right to vote. So this really does say, listen, county auditors, you need to work with those, with those indigenous communities and give them a day that will be special to them for them to be able to vote um, as needed. So we really hope that can increase voter turnout um, within our Native communities. Protecting the vote is some of the bigger stuff um, that we have going on here. Um, and some of the most interesting things, we have some law lawsuits bubbling up against some of, um, some of these laws. You may have heard that even for Restore the Vote, there is a lawsuit that is trying to rescind that. Um, we also have one that's trying to uh, rescind some of these as well. So protecting Minnesota voters from voter intimidation, harassment, deceptive practices. Uh, this is a, a tough one for free speech. Uh, this is one of them that's under attack right now. Basically what we're saying is that um, we, you want to impede a person's efforts to, anyone who impedes a, perfect, a person's efforts to encourage others, cast a ballot or assist another in registering to vote, traveling to a polling place or casting a ballot, all those things. You can't have voter intimidation and harassment and deceptive practices, things that could lead to fraud we want to prohibit. We also want to protect election officials, of course. We've seen more and more, and we have seen it here in Minnesota. We, in talking to election officials, um, a lot of stressed out folks who had people who would, you know, stay after hours, walk out to their car, I mean, these, it's just not okay to be able um, to harass our election officials. But um, I'm gonna go back to this one. But the, the question about um, you know, prohibit, prohibiting voter intimidation, harassment, deceptive practices, some of this is, um, this is one of them that is, uh, has a lawsuit on it in terms of what does it mean to impede somebody else's effort to vote? Um, what are, you know, you, the idea is you can't knowingly lie or say false statements about, about issues and so uh, related to voting. So it's going to be interesting to see how some of these play out um, as we go through this voting session. So again, soliciting near polling places, some of these were in place, but they're a little more strong in terms of prohibiting, um, again, exhibiting, distributing any item that display reference to a candidate ballot question or political party. Uh, the state canvassing board, this is a big one. So this one is really saying, listen, once the state canvassing board declares, um, and this is how we pick the winner, uh, that's how it goes. So of course, this is what we saw after January 6th, a lot of people trying to um, have different electors and to influence that canvassing board in uh, inappropriate ways. So uh, all of these things are now, in, are now in existence for the 23 election. So students, um, lots of new things for post-secondary students. We had that 16, 17 for high school, but post-secondary students, if you look at this, all post-secondary schools must provide voter registration forms. That's not really huge must provide, all secondary schools must provide registration forms. So there is much more emphasis on um, here as well that, that colleges, our post-secondary schools have to have a vote coordinator. They have to create a, a website with information about elections and voting. So, um, so we really feel like, again, we're getting a lot more information out there for our college age students. Um, Oh, these are all, there's so many, I keep remind, reminding myself that I do this. The other thing is huge is access to multi-unit housing. Um, apartment buildings, essentially. Uh, residential facilities must allow candidates and campaign volunteers to knock on doors. This was a big issue during census. <clears throat> trying to count the census and trying to be able to enter uh, doors. And so that, that privilege was extended. Now, extending that now 
to campaigns. Again, just because you live in a facility, a, an apartment doesn't mean for you as a voter, you should be able to have access to candidates talking to you. Um, and candidates should be able to access people at their addresses. So this is a big new, uh, new initiative and it's been a big barrier in the past. Um, and then there's my personal favorite, which is my own personal little law, um, candidate filing and contact information. Candidates slash campaign are required to provide non-government issued email. So when we were doing vote 411, we found that like, uh, like a third of all candidates or more did not provide an email, which made it very difficult <clears throat> to connect with them. And, and the Secretary of State's office said they got a lot of calls. That was their number one call of complaint when people couldn't reach candidates. And so, um, uh, you know, in any way, because they give a PO box or something. So people really wanted emails. And so they wrote, wrote, we wrote that into the bill and then it passed. So now um, there, it was very easy, much easier for us as Mary uh, Broadwood attest as someone who had to work on this uh, so diligently um, that we're now able to, to do a lot more with candidates via email. So this is a lot of great access. Um, how we determine a major party status, the order of candidates on the ballot. This is interesting in terms of how they are rotated on the ballot, um, adding for, again, um, just kind of greater fairness in the process. Um, last few here, um, National Popular Vote Compact. This was part of a separate bill, and it really surprised us. You might remember Kathy Saltzman. Kathy Saltzman was a state senator from our local area, lives here in Woodbury, and <clears throat> she was advocating uh, with, uh, with others on National Popular Vote Compact. And this was really our way of trying to start to get at uh, taking apart the Electoral College. One person, one vote. That's our way here with the League of Women Voters. And um, so we actually approved the, the National Popular Vote Compact, meaning um, we added our, I'm trying to think if it's 12 or 13 electors, 11, 12, 13, sorry, I don't remember, but somewhere in there, a number of electors <clears throat> that we have with our state. And if we got a few more states and a few more votes, uh, I think they're shy about 50 votes we could get above the threshold um, of the 270 that are required to um, uh, override the, uh, the electoral college. So this is a little bit symbolic for this election, but we are moving in the right direction around that conversation. The Help America Vote Act, this was big. We lobbied more on this than anything, I think, during my tenure, but this says that um, provides matching funds and authorized release release of HAVA funds authorized for Minnesota. And the way this was before was that even though the federal money was approved, the state legislature had to approve it being distributed. And we actually, with our um, divided government, uh, we had um, the year right before 2020 in that 2018-19 timeframe where the, the, the stalemate was there and we couldn't get it passed. So we missed during that critical 2020 election extra dollars that could have really helped with cybersecurity and other infrastructure. And so no longer can federal funds be held up um, because of political games playing in the legislature. <clears throat> so as with, with the HAVA funds. So that's, that's really great. So you'll see some other things here. Um, the Secretary of State, in terms of um, ranked choice voting, there's lots of folks who love ranked choice voting, and we do too. We like it and approve it for municipal elections, but have felt there wasn't quite enough information yet um, to, to use ranked choice voting on a statewide basis. So there will be a new study done about that. Um, there is another set of legislation, another set of policies that are related to campaign finance reform. I'm not going to walk through all of those tonight because there's so many things. But that's kind of the, the, the rundown of, um, of, of the new policies, the new laws. And before I jump into the next section, this would be a great time for questions, if there are any at this point. <clears throat> questions in the chat and we will ask um ask Michelle about them um uh 
One of the questions that came to mind, uh, Michelle, we have automatic absentee voter um, and voting from home. Uh, you know, you can automatically um, sign up for that. What other states have that? Do other states have it? And how well has that been received? Do you know? Well, so absentee voting, I think most all states have some form, right, of absentee voting. People call it vote from home, absentee voting. We have many states that actually just send the ballots out and people vote from home physically. So I don't know all the numbers, but see, but in the vote, the vote from home states are actually, you know, again, these are not heavily blue states or any heavily red states. There's a mixture of red and blue states that have successfully actually balloted, you know, from home. So we're kind of moving into where where it should be, right? Is is um, being able to give voters more discretion, uh, just making it easier. And then so I think we'll see the permanent status is just again clarifying for people. It, you don't have to every year go back and request it again. Um, how about um, you know we said people can take the day off from work. Is that, um, does that have to be counted as a vacation day from my own, um, you know, um, list of, of what I have? Or is that just automatically uh, done by the state? No, it is, it, that, that time has to be made available. I think there are very, you know, there are various, um, I think, rules depending on the type and size of the organization. And one of the things that we'll do when we're going through this is I'll show you where all the little um, handy fact sheets are on the Secretary of State's website that get into some more of the nitty gritty. But in general, no, the idea is really making that um, a protected time that's not part of your vacation or sick pay. Okay. We've got a question um, in our chat that says, will a 16-year-old who applies for a driving permit be automatically pre-registered to vote? Yes, that will happen um, again in 2024 when automatic uh, voting starts. Um, the only people who, you know, obviously one of the bigger questions has been because we also passed driver's licenses for all for people who are undocumented. Right. Um, and um, people who will get driver's licenses, but are, will not be able to register to vote. Um, so that will be a lot. I think that's a, an area that people are really concerned about, but an area that exists now. There are, there are thousands of people who don't have a citizenship, um, including the Secretary of State's mother. Um, she does not have U.S. citizenship, and so... Um, and she has a driver's license. So we handle this already, but that will be a, an issue there. Um, I see Ellen's question, if we request an absentee ballot, can we change our mind and vote in person? You absolutely can. Um, again, the idea is you, you, know, you can only vote once and it's all barcoded. And, and that's another great thing to realize is um, you know, if you uh, vote in person, then your absentee ballot would not be counted because everything with your ID has barcodes tied to it. And so uh, it's no problem that you could just, you know, I don't think I'll use the absentee ballot, I'll vote in person. They keep track of that. Um, okay. How, how I've got uh, one more question. How, um, how much of a um, <clears throat> threat but that's not the right word, but threat of losing the restoration of voting rights for felons, do you think there is? Yeah. You know, you said that's something that's... Yeah. Yeah. Well, um, <clears throat> sort of our, our nemesis, and we've, we've been a part of many lawsuits um, with a Minnesota Voters Alliance, and they are the ones uh, filing this lawsuit. Um, and we feel very confident they don't have any standing for it and that it, or any merit for it um, there. And so we I think the hearing is actually late October. Um, it should it will not affect any uh, potential people voting in the 23 election, but it is something we need to get resolved. Um, and uh, we feel 
as does the Attorney General and Secretary of State, that uh, restore the vote is definitely um, will prevail. And that's largely because of the other lawsuit we were involved in where we sued the Secretary of State in Simon v. Schroeder to try to um, get restore the vote through um, through a judicial solution when we couldn't get it on the legislature. And the court came back and said, hey, no, that's your job, legislature. They, they said very clearly, the state Supreme Court, that the state legislature has a lot of discretion about the rights um, of, of, of felons who are, are completing their sentence. So they, they kind of already said, of course, you can, you know, you can do this. But they're trying to um, create what we feel like. And, and unfortunately, this is that part of destroying people's confidence to vote. They're just trying to sow doubt, right? You're trying to, you don't have a real case here. And I hope it's just dismissed. I mean, there are some uh, in the other two issues where there are lawsuits. I mean, I think there's some interesting issues. I don't agree with them. But in this one, I think it's just a direct uh, assault on people uh, on our 55,000 new newly enfranchised voters to try to get them to be afraid to vote. Yeah, and uh, we certainly hope that won't be the case. We've got another yeah. question from Rebecca. How much of this information do election judges need in preparation for the November 2023 elections, and how is it being provided to them? Great question. So we know that the um, all of our election officials are working fast and furious to do what they need to do on their end. Again, a lot of these um, changes are really more voter registration activated, um, timing, um, in terms of serving as an election judge, you know, the ballot board will have, you know, there'll be more time, things like that. So there's definitely new things for election judges, but um, I think we feel very confident the Secretary of State's educating everybody um, that that kind of orientation, you know, will be delivered of what changes are necessary uh, for election judges to have to hold up. Um, another question. But it's no doubt a lot. Yeah. <laughs> will a driver's license for a non-citizen be different so an election judge can tell when looking at it for someone who is registering on election day? No, it will not be uh, different. Now, I, I think that if you remember on election day, same day voting, people can vouch uh, for you, right? And, and you really are signing, if you vote on election day, um, you really are saying you are who you say you are and you're signing an oath of a threat of perjury. That is how it is today. And that's how it would be again, if somebody was a, a citizen and a, not a, a correct, you know, a, a natural, when you sign that, when you sign that, you know, poll book, either electronically or on paper, you are saying, I certify that I am who I am. So, um, the way I say it is that, you know, if there were, if people were to commit voter fraud, you've got to think about, you know, it's just like stopping at a red light. There is not a police, you know, officer there watching everybody go through the lights, right? You, there, we, there are laws and then there are consequences to laws. And this is threat of deportation and threat of, uh, you know, of, of felony perjury. So, um so a lot, all of those things that are just in place for the general public will still be in place um, when our undocumented citizens, um, you know, are, if, if they wanted to try to vote inappropriately, all of those same incentives or disincentives are there. So <clears throat> that's well, just how that goes. It's a follow-up with, um, on the license, will it say anything about citizen or undocumented or anything no because okay. the again the idea is not to also discriminate against our undocumented um you know our undocumented population who are working and um paying taxes and <laughs> right raising yep. kids so the way to think of it right is that um it really is the same day registration and, and that is that you're saying, hey, I'm an election judge and people are coming in with if they came in with, a, a, you know, that's what you're asking. Right. If as an election judge, you come in and you somebody has a driver's license, 
um, and how could, could they sneak through? Um, <clears throat> you could ask the same question. Hey, I have somebody come, who comes in with a fake driver's license. They could sneak through or with fake ID or they vouch for somebody and they're not correct. Or mm -hmm. there's a lot of things that can happen uh, in same day voter registration that over time, all the studies we've done, the recount, we do the post-election review audits, all of those show that people do not come out in droves to, to vote, vote fraudulently. We also see that, um, you know, if votes are close, you know, if elections are close and there's, there's, if, if people are worried that their things went wrong, they can request recounts and they can, we do recounts. So, I think it is going to be um, an issue. It's something we've talked about in terms of the talking points for this. I think in 24, it'll be a big issue, um, you know, because of the concern people have that people who are undocumented are going to show up in droves and try to vote on election day. Um, but again, think about that. <laughs> you know, why? What, what incentive is there for them just to, ca you know, to cast a vote? Um, and and be the threat of perjury or being deported. So um, there might be some additional language I can offer once that all comes to pass. And we're some of those we're waiting for a little more clarity from the Secretary of State's office too. But great. Um, another yeah. question: What are ways to prove U.S. citizenship? Prove U.S. citizenship. Um, I guess I don't know. I don't know that question. We don't ask people to prove their U.S. citizenship um, other than, the, I mean, as the verification of the, through like we as election judges or individuals, that that would be all done at um, the voter registration state, right? So people who register to vote, again, all that information and being part of the whole e full book is that all that voter registration information, including if you were, um, uh, if there, are, it's, you know, people who um, are not supposed to be voting, you know, if we have that information <clears throat> in there, as, as all that verification is done at the time of voter registration. So there's, <clears throat> that's done on the back end by the Secretary of State's office, and think of all the types of things that have to be done to, you know, when I think of our newly naturalized citizens, all that we do, uh, you know, 12, 13,000 voter registrations every year of people having to have their social security number or their driver's license or their birth certificate. So all of our citizens have, you know, have, a, have been vetted, right? At some point in time, they've had to prove that they are who they say they are and live where they say they do. Um, by the time, and it's just that same day election provision, um, again, where, um, and, and again, the automatic voter registration for people who are really worried about, um, about integrity, election integrity, so many more people will already be registered to vote. Right. Uh, we will have a lot, lot, lot less um, same day registration, which would also make if there was some mass fraud about to take place <laughs> look a lot more obvious but um but it, it's just not what we see and what we find happening um you are going to comment on 411 and um yes so and some disinformation misinformation so why don't we um have you yeah. do that um great um that'd be well, I'm very quickly yeah, going to show you our new homepage, which is very um, out. We're, we're excited because it's very uh, voter directed. This just opened on Friday, but if you go to our homepage, you will find just a wonderful, easy way to get to everything that voters need um, to make their decisions. So the register to vote icon, the verify now, both of these go to the Secretary of State's office because they have the best uh, interface portal. Our candidate forums. These link right up to all our candidate forums. We um, thanks to Mary Bread. Many thanks to Mary Bread on many things tonight. But all of our candidate forums are on here and linked. And 
uh, when they're going to happen, when they have happened and are recording, I'm going down to Woodbury Cottage Grove because you'll see they're already there. Um, uh, there we go. So all of those are already here. Um, and she scours people's individual sites to try to find them. We hope that our local leaders will give them to us. So we really hold those up. Uh, the other piece she's done a great job of is putting maps together, uh, these wonderful GIS maps that show where all the elections are. These have really been important or helpful for us during um, reaching out with Greater Minnesota because a lot of people don't realize, wow, you've got ballot, special ballot question, you've got things going on. They're like, oh, we do? I didn't know that. So she's, we've got all these great maps that show where all the different elections are across the state for different reasons. So yay, Mary, of course. <clears throat> and um, then um, also on here, um, of course, you can access Vote 411. And Vote 411 itself is live and active. Um, it's got our branding right on it. You can um, put in your information, find out your candidates, your ballot, all of this good stuff is right accessible on that homepage. Um, all our vote 411, our message to candidates, if they're wondering how to, you know, get access to fill out the survey, if people want to become partners, we've got the information on voting in person, the information on voting from home, all of this has been updated with the new information um, from the new election laws about voting, and um, which is great, and we've got all the little widgets that tell people, what I like is, how to fill out your ballot. We've got all of that in here too. How to, there it is, like, ah, oh, this three, you know, three envelope thing. So we've got all the instructions in there and in how to do all of that. Um, and then we also have um, uh, other great local papers um, to find information. Then how elections work. These are those voting fact sheets I was telling you about. Here's a link to those election law changes. And then how our elections work. And this is really our, as I would say, sort of our, our great space for um, election um, uh, to fight myths and disinformation. It's kind of like your yard, you know, you have to feed the soil to prevent the weeds. And part of that is to do the sort of truth telling about what are the safeguards that we have in place and so we have on this site, our election 411 page, a lot of information. I think this would make a great trivia game, you know, <laughs> you know, wouldn't that be fun? Okay, now, all ballots are open and counted in what? Bipartisan pairs. <laughs> um, lots of information about how we keep and um, to keep our elections safe and why we know they are fair and accurate. And a big part is this piece here I wanted to talk about uh, before we close today is, a, is this independent election observation. Uh, we did participate in 2022 um, in the post-election review with Citizens for Election Integrity Minnesota. And what that meant was we had volunteers who went um, to several of the, I think we did 10 counties, and we just observe the post-election audits. Every county has to randomly select a certain number of precincts and hand count all the ballots after the election from those precincts to ensure the accuracy of the process. And uh, we witness and observe that and then prepare a report. And that really helps, again, to create that ongoing record of accuracy and a lot of folks will say, well, why don't we audit election sites? We do. <laughs> so we do find a lot of this is really, again, as a legal women voter, we encourage you to be as educated as you can on all of these, um, on all of these great things. So anyway, do, oops, sorry, um, uh, and Vote 411 is just, we're very excited to, to get going on that and get online and Sorry, my it's going over. Um, check out our new new web page and just be. I think you'd be very proud to let everybody know it's out there. I wanted to say just um, in closing a couple quick things about nonpartisanship because Betsy asked me to touch on that too. And you know, this is just very quickly. Every time this year, people are like, oh, we need to be nonpartisan," but it's a reminder that 
issues are not partisan. Democracy is not partisan. Facts are not partisan. Only people are partisan, right? People are partisan because they are running for office or they have a political party. So, um, so our nonpartisan stance, you know, is that we do not endorse candidates or political parties. We don't endorse or oppose them. Um, so this little handy thing, these are actually these tools um, are from the slideshow in our DEI section on our webpage on our, on our website. But I love this little one here to think about, is this a partisan activity? Because this is where people really um, get mixed up in this time of year. And it is, once people are candidates, we're certainly a lot more intent. Once, a, once an elected official becomes a candidate, they're a candidate first. So that's why, like, if, a, if, if you wanted to say, let's say you wanted one of the school board members to show up at an event right now, you wouldn't do that if they're running for office. Um, but the school board members who are not running for office could. But those who aren't, when someone's a declared candidate, you want to treat them that way. So this little thing is kind of nice. Are you supporting or opposing an elected official? Yes. Uh-oh, then it's partisan. Where, you know, somebody's like, hey, come to this event. We're voting for Michelle Witte. That's a partisan. No matter what election you're running for, that's endorsing or supporting an official. Are you partnering with a political party? Yes. Yikes. Partnering with politicians is partisan activity um, in a, an election season especially. So, you know, oh, okay, so are you publicly supporting or opposing an issue based on a position? Um, yes, is still, you can still do that, right? So I think about this um, during this time, we're often challenged right now, of course, with the presidential election. It's certainly still fine and good to say, listen, we believe that, um, you know, the elections are fair and accurate and January 6th was an insurrection and an assault on our democracy. Um, that is still a true statement. It's not a partisan statement um, to say, we, therefore, we don't support Donald Trump. Now I've made it a partisan statement, okay? Or therefore, I do support Donald Trump. <laughs> so the idea is you can still talk about the issue. We do not um, agree with um, people who are in public. We don't agree with people who believe that our elections were stolen. That's you know, again, issues aren't partisan. People are. And, and it's, it's a tough thing sometimes, but if you think about it like that, like, you know, the issues themselves are just the issues. Our issues have been the same for, you know, a lot of them 50 years. Um, we can't help what people do to how they think about the issues. So, so a lot to take in, um, and I'll end with my favorite, one of my favorite quotes, and I just always love John Lewis and miss him any election now, but, you know, ours is not the struggle of one day, one week, or one year. Ours is not the struggle of one judicial appointment or presidential term. Ours is the struggle of a lifetime or even many lifetimes, and each one of us in every generation must do our part. And so it's just that constant reminder that the work we're doing now, it's absolutely true. Um, 20 years ago, and for the last 20 years, people were working on Restore the Vote, and things didn't happen. And suddenly, we were able to make it happen. Most all those things we're working on now, the rights we're working to change, the things we're trying to do, are probably going to benefit not us, but someone behind us. It's because someone ahead of us worked hard for the rights we enjoy today. So we have to keep remembering that. That's our, our role here, is to do the work because it's what, what democracy requires. And we, we just don't always get things to happen the way they have. They, they are or the way we want them to. Um, I use that a lot when we weren't winning in the legislature. <laughs> so this year was our year, but you think about it in this last year, we've worked for many years and many decades with some of these issues that finally transpired. So I hope that leaves a little slice of, of, uh, of hope um, as you Think about this election season, the role we play in the season, the importance of these local elections, I can't tell you, um, to com continue to really um, just share, share, share um, the forums that you're doing and make sure that people can see and uh, who the candidates are. That's the role we play. Uh, voters will make their decisions. 
but our role is to be able to give that good information so that people have the information and the confidence to participate in the process. Thank you, Michelle. I, I want to just reiterate what what's in the chat. Um, that vote 411 page is so good, easy to use and to find information. Wow. And the web page and all it provides is very impressive. Thank you. And I know great, you, great. you and all the staff at the state really worked very hard. And ha I mean, it's really been amazing to watch the evolution since I, I've been involved now eight years with the league, I guess nine years. And just where we've come um, from, um, you know, what what the web page used to be and how to navigate <laughs> it. And I mean, it's <clears throat> it's just amazing. So thank you. Um, thank you. Of course, we have to thank our Mary Brad because we know um, the, the technology <laughs> the electronic component is so critical um, for uh, for all of the communication that goes out. So uh, thank you very much. We really appreciate it. And we appreciate everybody who's been on our, um, our event this evening and it is being recorded. And I'm going to turn it over to Andrea as we um, close up tonight. Thank you again, Michelle. You bet. My pleasure. Well, thank you again to Michelle Witte and also to Betsy Stites for the program tonight on this very important topic. Uh, I know there's a lot of new things to learn and this helped me clarify some things. So I, and I expect it helped everyone else as well. Um, so I have a few reminders for people about some programs coming up. I'm going to put some links in the chat as I go here. So if you see me kind of Here's the first one. So first next week, Monday is our annual sampler event at the machine shed. It is a really fun round robin style event with the league that is both for members and for anyone interested in learning more about the league. Um, I wanna make sure everyone knows this really is not just for new members and people who are interested. Um, we wanna encourage everybody to go and also bring a friend or two or three or four. <laughs> it is not just um, for new members. We It's a good way to sort of see what's going on. You know, things change a little bit year to year. There might be some other areas we're working in or have new things going on. So um, really wanna encourage everyone to go. Um, and, and it's just fun to hang out with each other and enjoy some appetizers too. So again, that's on Monday, October 2nd at the Machine Shed. That's one week from tonight. Check-in starts at 545. There's more information on the website, which I've already put in the chat. Um, and for those of you who are watching the recording, it's on our website, lbwwcg.org. Um, under the blog, there's a bunch of the things that I'm going to be mentioning tonight. So, and I wanna remind everyone, even though we do have an RSVP, you do not have to register for this because we want you to come. We don't want you to say, oh shoot, I can't go, I didn't register. We really want you to come. <laughs> or if you decide I'm bringing my neighbor today, they're not registered. They can still come. Please bring them. <laughs> so the next thing I wanted to mention, I know Michelle already really encouraged this, but please, please, please share our candidate forums. This year we had two forums. One was District 833. That's the South Washington County School Board. And the other one we had was the St. Paul Park City Council. Those are both up both on the SWCTC website and YouTube page and also on our website. So that's the next link that I'm going to drop in here. Um, please share those with people who live, you know, in the in those areas. Um, it's really important, I think, to get that information out out to people. It's a great way to get to know the candidates. It's so hard to get to know local candidates. Otherwise, you know, there's just not as much information about out there. And we do promote the vote, vote 411 in our candidate forums too. <laughs> the third thing I wanted to mention is that we're going to have an information session on October 16th about the bond that's on the ballot. For those of you who live in District 833, I think it'll be a shorter presentation. It's really just information that we're helping share from the district, and then we're going to have a Q&A with that as well. So it'll probably be more in the range of 30 to 40 minutes, and I'm putting that in the chat. And then the last thing that I wanted to mention is that we do have our Let's Talk series coming up, and that's always been a really nice, um, interesting, um, wonderful connection and um, with other members. It really gets um, into really good topics and conversations. So the one that's coming up is going to be on the story of Mamie Till Mobley, the mother of Emmett Till. And I'm going to put that in the link. And if anyone is not a member who was on here, this is a member only program, but um, it's really wonderful. So I hope that um, one are really wonderful group of people. So I hope that 
some of you who have not joined us before will consider joining. Um, so that about wraps us up. Make sure you check out the links in the chat for those of you who are watching live. And um, we will have this on our YouTube channel. So if anyone, you know, knows that they have someone who'd like to watch this and missed it, um, you should be able to share this from our, our, our YouTube within the next two days. All right. I think that about wraps us up. Thank you again for joining us.